Okay, good morning, everybody. <clears throat> Welcome to the June meeting of the California Strategic Growth Council. Um, let's see, I think the first thing I wanna do is do a roll call starting uh, with Matt. <laughs> Here. Well, you, <laughs> you might want to say who you are. Oh. Hi, everyone. I'm Alexis Podesta, <laughs> the Secretary at the Business Consumer Services and Housing Agency. Fabulous. Still here. <laughs> Brian Anna, Secretary of the Transportation Agency. Bob Fisher, public member. Ken Alex, Director of Office of Planning and Research. Good morning. I'm Karen Ross. I'm Secretary of the California Department of Food and Agriculture. I'm Michael Flatt. I'm a public member. I'm John Laird, Secretary for Natural Resources. And Mike Wilkinen, Secretary for Health and Human Services. And by the way, congratulations on that. <laughs> that has happened since our last meeting. I, yeah. Why, thank you. I think that just pushed me over the 50% uh, with condolences and congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, clearly being on this council is the highlight. <laughs> Um, okay, so we just, uh, we had a closed session uh, and want to report out of that closed session. Um, I think many of you uh, uh, probably know that uh, Randall Winston, our executive director, um, and without uh, editorial comment, has decided to go to law school. Um, and so will be leaving us uh, as, as director um, and the, uh, the council has, uh, uh, we'll, we'll laud him in a moment, he'll get, he'll get his. Um, but uh, uh, the uh, closed session decision uh, is to uh, hire Louise Bedsworth, who's currently the deputy director at the Office of Planning and Research, and so she is, uh, will be replacing Randall July 12th. Uh, as the executive director of the Strategic Growth Council. So congratulations, Louise. Uh, and uh, we've also, uh, uh, unfortunately, we're, we're having a little uh, staff change right now. Uh, our deputy director, Marlene Delo, is uh, also leaving at the end of next month. Um, and so the, uh, uh, Louise and I have been given authority to, um, to uh, work through the process to determine the next deputy director as well. So uh, with that. Mr. Uh, uh, Chair. Uh, yes, Mr. I think in the, in the report out of the closed session, we should note uh, that it was a unanimous vote so that the unanimous vote is reported out as, as well. I uh, appreciate that. C correction. So, uh, <laughs> uh, all true. And uh, so, with that, I uh, open it to uh, to council members for uh, for their update and for any comments they they wish to make at the outset. Oh, the minutes. Uh, all right, let's do the minutes. All right, minutes have been moved. And seconded, any comment on the minutes? All in favor of adopting the minutes, say aye. 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 All opposed? Unanimous? I'll abstain, because I wasn't at Oh, this. we have one abstention and otherwise unanimous on the minutes, so the minutes are approved. Now, uh, any uh, council updates or comments that folks wish to make? Anybody want to start? Yes, Bob. No, I, I oh, just, you uh, were just, yeah. Yeah, I just, um, you know, as, I guess as the longest standing member of the Growth Council, I just want to make sure to, uh, to voice my, my uh, displeasure in Randall's departure <laughs> and uh, to wish him incredible success. It's uh, having, having sat on this council through, uh, through three different leaders, uh, you know, when you came in, the council was really looking for a direction and leadership, and um, I think you have provided both of those in a, in a really outstanding way and gotten us. It's not easy to get a group like this on track and uh, all, all uh, lined up behind the, the tip of the spear, but I think you've done that in a, 
in a really elegant and uh, and uh, impactful way. And I just want to. The state is uh, is grateful. I'm grateful. And uh, thank you for everything you've done. And best of luck in your next career. Okay. Uh, I suspect that Bob speaks for all of us, so we don't want to overdo this, but I, you know, it, is, it, it has been, you know, I've had the pleasure of working with you since you started as a fellow uh, in eight years ago, seven years ago, and uh, to have you here as the executive director today um, and, and now wrapping that up and heading to law school, congratulations, thank you. Um, and uh, as Bob said, huge amount of appreciation from this council and on behalf of, of the public that you've served so well. So, and uh, uh, also congratulations to Louise. <laughs> Karen. So um, I want to add my thanks um, and skepticism about, well, no, just, <laughs> just kidding. Um, there's no doubt in my mind that we've just begun to see all that you can contribute to this great state. That's, that's a hint to stay in California, okay? Um, I had the pleasure of traveling with Randall to China when he was still in the governor's office um, and learned um, what a broad perspective and how thoughtful he was in very different ways when you're on an airplane traveling, you get to do that. But I especially appreciate what you have brought to the council with regard to really understanding the different perspectives that each one of us bring here and our areas of interest. And most importantly, the investment that you've made to make sure that our investment in technical assistance is real and is producing meaningful results. Um, we have seen that in agriculture. We've seen it in the community work that's happening. Um, and I think that we have started something here that cannot be unwound, and that's for the good of California as well. So for all of that, for pulling your staff together, um, for the leadership that you've shown and all the communities you've visited, thank you. Um, there's no doubt in my mind that Louise will carry that on very, very well. And I just don't know what you're going to do at OPR because <laughs> of all the things she's working on that touch so many of our agencies. But thank you and good luck to you. I, I will say in the tradition of the Brown administration, you don't lose a title. <laughs> you, you just keep... <laughs> 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 okay. Um, onward. Mr. Chair, yeah. Yes, Brian. It sounds, it sounds like this is the time to uh, provide uh, thanks to Randall, so I didn't want to want to miss the opportunity either. And I guess my my perspective is I've you know some understanding of the challenges of of uh, uh, working with public boards, <laughs> managing public boards, because we have several in the transportation agency, as well as the challenge of managing uh, competitive grant programs, because we have those challenges as well. So I really uh, I do think you've done an outstanding job, uh, Randall, and, and I, I know how hard it is. So, you know, the uh, uh, we run, go through these very public processes and at times we've had a lot of money, at other times not so much money, and, you know, it's always challenging in either scenario. And, you know, the work you've done with communities around the state, with different stakeholders around the state, you've traveled so extensively, you've worked with so many groups, and it's really, I think, uh, strengthened these programs. It's, Strategic Growth Council. So thank you for the work you and, and your staff have done over your period here and best wishes in the future. And, and Mr. Chair, yes. it, it's, you know, there's that old adage that uh, everything has uh, been said, but not everyone has said it yet. <laughs> uh, 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 and I think uh, as somebody that in this job uh, sits on 26 boards and commissions and, and conservancy boards, uh, this was among them one of the biggest challenges when when Randall walked in the door and I think he really had some work to do and he did it really admirably and he put up with me because I would not tell him the time I would tell him how the watch was built uh, uh, <laughs> and walk through how certain things had gotten to the point I in the hopes that he could learn from the mistakes that other people made and not make them. And he put up with it and he did very well. Although he did not ask me in any mentoring sense whether he should go to law school. <laughs> and yet I think the great thing is, is one of the things I think about a certain few people that I interact with in this job is that I hope 
you will remember who I am and we are because you're going to be in charge of something major at some point, and I'm going to want something. <laughs> <laughs> and I just think this is just another step on the path uh, uh, on that road, and I just wish you well. All right. Anybody else? <laughs> Matt. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll be brief. Uh, I'll just uh, say that uh, you know it's been a tremendous pleasure. Um, I remember also being with uh, Randall in China and uh, being happy that I was not younger because um, <laughs> uh, there was no way that I could compete with somebody who has the talent and the vision and uh, the ability to articulate that vision the way that Randall does. Um, and uh, it's it's. He's been incredible here at uh, the SGC. I, I, we, were, we were struggling with what was the SGC about? What were we going to do? Uh, and, and, you know, as we talked about, we didn't have the time to focus on the SGC. We needed an executive director who had some vision who could help direct us. Uh, and I think that Randall's done that marvelously. Um, and uh, I will tell people that. Um, you know, I think he's a model for how you go out and represent a state agency and a state agency program. Watching the way he's gone out to the communities and work with the communities, work with some very, very skeptical groups over time and won them over. Um, it ha it's been uh, amazing to watch. So I'm not too sure what he will learn in law school <laughs> uh, because I think he already knows it. Um, but um, I look forward to, to watching his career in the future. Uh, I see just tremendous things for him, and I hope I'm around to uh, uh, be able to, to work with him in the future. So uh, thanks for everything that you've done. And if you weren't impressed enough already, uh, Randall also has a, an architecture degree and speaks Chinese. So Well, you stole that, my thunder, Kim. I, or Ken, I was going to um, announce all of the other things <laughs> and why Randall is bound uh, to be more successful than any one of us in this room because he holds all of these prestigious degrees and is off to get one more. Um, Randall and I have had the opportunity to work, to work together a long time, we'll just leave it at that. Um, and that China trip you all hear about, Randall and I were behind the scenes through uh, the planning and execution of that trip in the trenches, literally, um, and got to know each other pretty well. Um, so thank you for everything, and good luck. Okay, over to you. <laughs> well, wow. Um, uh, it has truly been an honor to serve. Um, I won't, you know, belabor comments too much because there's just, uh, I think, an outpouring of thanks and deep appreciation on my part. Um, I have learned so much from all of you over these past, uh, not just really three, but seven years, the time here at SGC and uh, in Governor Brown's office in ways you know, that are kind of too, too many to count, but it's been truly formative. And if I, if I have uh, any ability or capacity, it, it's literally because of all of you um, and, and your leadership. So you've, you've set the model and I'm hopeful to uh, continue to follow in the, in the footsteps of what you've done. I also wanna thank the team, definitely, um, and the SGC staff. They have, they have been the ones who really, I think, carried the water to where this organization has been able to come if we've been able to achieve what we've been able to achieve. So um, a huge thanks to them as well. Um, and uh, you know, I'm really glad also to leave the SGC in such skilled and capable hands. Um, and I have no doubt that uh, Luis is going to take, I think, this organization to even greater levels of impact and achievement. So um, thank you again. Uh, this is definitely not a goodbye. Uh, a little stepping away, maybe going down to, to uh, hopefully what's not too bad of a decision. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, my, my, my heart will certainly remain dedicated to the public and uh, uh, serving those most in need, and I'm excited to find new opportunities to do so. So with that, uh, I'm gonna dive into the executive director's report and what will be my final executive director's report, hopefully brisk and to the point, 
uh, before we get to a couple of action items today. So I'll just go through some informational updates, a little bit of an update on TCC, our climate change research program, and then turn it over to Natalie for a legislative report. Um, so I wanted to, to, you know, there's, there's uh, oftentimes where myself or the team is around the state speaking at different events, um, and there's one that I wanted to highlight here today. Uh, last week, there was a regional policy, policy summit at, at UC Riverside at a new center for innovation that they've, that they've, that they've launched, um, particularly on advancing inclusive development. Um, I wanted to share, to share that because I think as this council knows, uh, through AHSC and through some of our other programs, we've uh, over the past couple of years overcome quite a number of challenges throughout the Inland Empire and so far as um, technical assistance, helping officials uh, and community groups, they're partnering with them to advance both some of SGC's goals and our funding. Um, and I think we have some real successes to, to point to. The convening at UCR last week was really, um, I think, a coming together of leaders, both in Riverside, San Bernardino County, uh, developers, community leaders, community-based organizations, um, and SGC, I think, remains central to um, uh, how growth in that region will continue to hopefully progress in line with our, with our climate goals. Uh, uh, it was an incredible, I think, display of partnerships, and we're looking forward to staying deeply involved um, moving forward. So I wanted to, wanted to mention that. Um, an update quickly here on health and all policies. Um, the Government Alliance on Race and Equity work continues in full swing. Uh, there will be a training on workforce equity and community engagement for staff later this month. Um, the team has also undertaken uh, a study on racial pay data equity analysis along with the Government Operations Agency, and we are sharing those lessons and again incorporating them into the state's uh, um, human resources planning. Uh, next month, uh, you'll have as an action item approval of the Parks and Healthy Tree Canopy Action Plan, uh, which I think now uh, takes upon additional resonance with the passage of Prop 68. Uh, and then on June 27th, there will be a, a think tank on violence prevention. Annual grant program cycle. So I've mentioned this at previous meetings, but I wanted to sort of put a fine point on it here with the passage of uh, uh, 398 and now the continuation of cap and trade funds. Every single program at SGC we are endeavoring now to just place on an annual program cycle. Um, you'll hear of obviously the AHSC awards today, um, but we could say the same for SALK and for TCC and uh, we'll see about research and other programs moving forward. But the, the idea here is to create an expectation uh, throughout the state and amongst the public about the, you know, the continuous funding that we have and the schedule for those, for those programs. So we're excited to, to you know, finally be able to be able to do that. TCC, just quickly an update, an update here. We are uh, right now in the midst of uh, getting feedback on our round two guidelines, which were released earlier this month. Month We all public workshops in Oakland and, and Southgate and a webinar, I believe, yesterday. Uh, the deadline for public comments will be tomorrow, and so hopefully uh, those who have comments to deliver will, will, will get them in on time, and then we'll be bringing the guidelines, the final guidelines, to you all for approval at our next meeting late in July. Climate change research program, and again, wanted to give a quick update here. I know, I know I did so last time, but just to remind you all, we had 69 proposals requesting approximately $87 million. Um, we have wrapped up an assessment and evaluation process, and that's included um, input from an advisory committee, which consists of uh, um, individuals from academia and with backgrounds in community engagement, and that's to conduct both a uh, merit or scientific review, as well as a review of the community engagement components of the proposals. Uh, and then in addition to that, an interagency review consisting of um, experts from all of your agencies and, and, and departments. Um, so we are finalizing those decisions now and anticipate posting award recommendations on July 20th. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to... So, so let me note on that, um, there are 69 proposals requesting 87 million, but we have about 10 million to hand out. So <laughs> just 
so everybody knows. Thank you for that <laughs> note, Chair. Sorry, <laughs> sorry for uh, uh, forgetting that, that small detail, uh, not so small detail. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I will turn it over to Natalie. She is right here. There you go. And while Natalie's coming up, uh, just to remind everybody, if you want to uh, speak on any item, please fill out a speaker card and bring it up to the front. Thank you. Great. Thank you. It's a tough act to follow. Um, so we just wanted to quickly go over a budget update and a legislative update. Um, so the cap and trade expenditure plan was negotiated separately from the larger budget. Um, it hasn't been passed, but we now know what the figures will look like um, within that. I think it's actually going to be voted um, on in the Senate today. Um, so there will be $40 million for the Transformative Climate Communities Program. That's up from $25 million in the governor's proposed budget and up from $10 million that was awarded to the program last year in the budget. Uh, there will also be $18 million for the Climate Change Research Program. Um, that's down from $35 million <laughs> in the um, governor's proposed budget, but it is up from the $11 million that was received last year. And then there will be $2 million for technical assistance, which is um, new. That was not in the governor's proposed budget. In terms of legislative updates, there are four bills that mention the Strategic Growth Council that are still working their way through the process. All of these bills have made it out of the policy committees um, and they're in appropriations in the second house. So SB 1072, as we've mentioned before, would establish regional climate collaboratives that would build capacity in areas that have a lot of disadvantaged communities and have not been as successful for uh, applying for state funding opportunities. Um, it would also include a technical assistance component for programs at state agencies that target disadvantaged communities. And the Strategic Growth Council would assist by creating guidelines on what good technical assistance looks like. Um, AB 2434 would establish the HIAP program in statute. Right now, it exists in an executive order. Um, and that would have a sunset um, of 2024, but it would give time for the program to show its um, efficacy and its value. AB 2258 would establish a grant program at SGC for LAFCOs. Um, and then finally, AB 2252, which we haven't mentioned here before because it was recently amended, uh, would establish a state grants portal. So all state grant opportunities would be on the same website. And SGC would have a consulting role to make sure that that website was very user-friendly um, and would tap into our knowledge of our technical assistance programs and how to make grant information um, really usable for a variety of communities. Questions? Okay, okay. thank you. So moving on to item seven, California Climate Investment Technical Assistance Program, Monica. Good morning, Council. Um, so really quick before I start, I, I hadn't anticipated being a little emotional this morning <laughs> until I heard all of the, the well wishes for Randall. And I think I just want to chime in and say thank you to you, Randall, for, for, for lifting this work up as, as a big priority for you. And um, I'm, I'm excited to be up here to talk about how we can continue to grow the work even in, even in your absence. So bear with me if I am a little sad. Um, but anyways, um, I will be also try to keep this brief and happy to answer any questions you may have um, about what we're proposing today. Um, but before you, the recommended action is to approve um, $5 million from fiscal year 2018-2019 to support activities of the California Climate Investments Technical Assistance Program. So by way of, a, of background, you all have seen this uh, a bit before. Um, Strategic Growth Council received $500,000 in the Budget Act of 2015 to pilot a technical assistance concept in the Affordable Housing Sustainable Communities Program. Um, you might remember uh, about a year ago, we came to you all with a report on the success of that program, <laughs> as well as an, a really helpful evaluation that was conducted by UC Davis that evaluated our model and some ways that we could continue to improve upon um, our, that model and also grow technical assistance um, to serve other climate investments programs. Um, additionally, in, in 2016, we received $2 million through the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund to, to continue this work and, and work across climate investments um, in recognition that um, 
for in order for disadvantaged and low-income communities to really be able to access these dollars, we need to provide some support in, in creating these projects and supporting communities through the application process. Um, and so in, in what we're presenting to you today, there, there are two, two items to keep in mind. Um, one, as you know, um, Strategic Growth Council receives a 20% continuous appropriation from the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund um, for the Affordable Housing Sustainable Communities Program. Um, and then in addition to that, the Air Resources Board um, creates funding guidelines for all of our agencies that administer California climate investments programs to um, uh, guide us on how we can really maximize our benefits to communities. Um, the latest draft of those guidelines uh, provide a lot of direction and guidance for we as agencies to really support activities such as technical assistance and in fact encourage us to really look at that uh, as a way of facilitating greenhouse gas reduction and these important benefits. So it's through these that we uh, are proposing to um, have $5 million from that continuous appropriation a small but significant portion, um, uh, a significant amount of funds for technical assistance to be used for this. So we have, through that $2 million that I mentioned, we have an existing program right now uh, that uh, has three goals. The first is to provide direct assistance to communities and actually going through the application process, um, understanding the whole scope of the application, quantifying greenhouse gas emissions, Certainly in, in many communities, these are not capacities that currently exist. So um, we work with communities to actually put these applications together. But at the same time, we have a long-term approach. And our second goal is to really build capacity in these communities around these subjects so that we can continue to lay the groundwork for further success in the future. And then the third and one that we continue to learn lessons about is integrating the climate investments programs. At this point, I think there are 30 different agencies that have climate investments money, so it continues to be a challenge to think about how all the programs fit together. But we recognize that it's important for communities to have a full picture of what they can access. Um, communities do not live single issue lives, and we recognize that. So we wanna be able to present to them the various opportunities that they can access um, to improve, improve their lives. So those are what we try to do um, in the programs. Um, I won't go through all of this now, and I realize this is an incredibly overwhelming slide, but um, you can see the program as it exists today consists of individualized technical assistance programs that serve, um, that are specific to climate investments programs. This is because each program is very unique and we wanna make sure that we cater our services uh, to meet the needs um, of that program. So some focus more on capacity building and are maybe more convening oriented right now. Others are very focused on assisting communities with project development and um, submitting applications. So a, a few outcomes that we have, um, a lot of this work is in progress and um, we are continuing to gather metrics um, and information about our success and, and learn from those and, and continue to improve our programs. The one that we have the most data about is the Affordable Housing Sustainable Communities Program since we had that pilot. Um, and interestingly, so the pilot uh, TA program, it was modeled, um, the way we modeled that is that we used applicants that had uh, failed in the first round and gave them technical assistance for the second round. Um, and because of that model, about 13% of the recipients were awarded AHSC funds. Um, UC Davis um, you know, gave us a, some direction to recon, uh, you know, reconsider how we chose our technical assistance recipients. We put out a call, an open call for technical assistance. Who needs help putting together an AHSC project? we received over 90 TA requests. So the demand is absolutely there, particularly for, for that program. Um, we were able to work with over, uh, over 29, but we had 29 submit applications and 42% of them are gonna be, are recommended for funding today. So we feel like we've definitely made some improvements to that program um, to, to really be meaningful and helpful to communities. Um, in addition, in, through the Transit Inner City Rail Capital Program, um, Secretary Annas, appreciate all your work on, on this as well. Um, that program included a community advisory board, a team of, of representatives from community-based organizations that actually weighed in on the TIRCP applications and talked about what are the potential harms, what are the potential benefits in these projects, and provided recommendations to CALSTA about how they can um, continue to improve community benefits through those projects, and um, the board also um, recommended five projects that we're gonna work with on the ground with community-based organizations um, to actually figure out what those benefits can be and those provisions can be. And then quickly through the, the active transportation program, just another example of demand, we did a similar survey. We had over 20 requests for technical assistance and we're only able to serve five communities, but 
work, that work is in progress now. And then um, the community, uh, California Department of Food and Agriculture has had a long history of providing technical assistance. Um, through some of the funds we were able to provide, they were able to conduct over 60 workshops throughout the state in rural, disadvantaged, and low-income communities. And they were able to extend one-on-one -on -one attention to over 200 uh, potential applicants. Um, and we've been in many conversations about how can we continue to improve that one-on-one -on -one interaction and attention because we know that that's really what it's gonna take for communities to be successful um, in these programs. Here we go. So um, here, so some of the ways we're gonna um, you know, continue to grow the program, I'm sure my colleague Virginia is really happy I put this picture here. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, uh, we're proposing to grow um, the program in one, you know, a couple of specific ways to uh, serve the Sustainable Agricultural Lands and Conservation Program. Um, staff, uh, Salk staff has really been doing some on the ground outreach themselves and really trying to promote projects in underserved communities in the state. But we know we need some more resources and assistance in order to do that. So we wanna have some a technical assistance component that really tries to drum up projects in some underserved parts of the state. And then additionally, and, and, and we're really excited to present this, um, we're also proposing to have a, a part, uh, establish a partnership uh, between the uh, California Department of Food and Agriculture and University of California Agricultural and Natural Resources um, to create a co-branded program that would really promote um, climate smart farming and ranching practices across the state. We know in order to, ha to really uh, have uptake of these practices, we need to be on the ground. We need to have folks who have trusted community relationships in place to be able to get the latest research to deployment in the communities that we really want to see it happening in. And so the structure of this program, uh, there, there's a lot of different things, um, but one, one, one way that this is going to be structured is that it, they will have farm advisors as well as community education specialists to really create that bridge that we need to get these practices in place in communities. Um, one of the other really exciting metrics for this program is that uh, the, one of the goals is to have at least 25% of the farmers and ranchers served be from us, uh, be socially disadvantaged farmers, and that's defined in the recently passed Farmer Equity Act. Um, and there will also be ongoing coordination with a um, farmer equity um, coordinator in which uh, CDFA is in the process of hiring right now. So we're really excited about uh, those opportunities to really look at our most disadvantaged communities and farmers and ranchers and that this program can really meet their needs. So as far as next steps, um, uh, we are, there's a couple of different things. There are some programs that have immediate technical assistance needs um, that we will uh, be looking to uh, create some requests for proposals and get some funds out the door so they can work with applicants in the near term. And we'll continue to work with stakeholders and our state agency partners in the design of other technical assistance programs moving forward. Um, a lot is in progress now in, in the current program and we wanna learn, take some of those lessons we learned like we did in the AHSBTA um, and continue to improve the capacity capacity building, direct assistance, and integrated CCI components of those programs. So that's it for me. Happy to take any questions. Um, I just want to note, uh, Monica, that mm -hmm. you've really been instrumental over the last couple of years in creating the technical assistance program, and it's become a model for across the government. So thank you for mm -hmm. your work. Thank you. Questions or, or comments? I just have comments. Obviously, I love the proposal about ag. <laughs> um, but I wanted to stress that I think this is a new model. And I think it is a model that has um, not only tremendous opportunity to scale up the practices on the land here in California, but a model for other states and other countries. When we look at how farming practices are adapted over time, cooperative extension is always at the core of that innovation. And what we are learning to really add the acreage as well as the number of farmers, they have questions beyond just, oh, what is this grant program and how do I apply? They have a lot of questions about what are the agronomic impacts mm -hmm. as well as the benefits. And it's that opportunity to use all that the UC system has about agriculture that has made it the number one ag state but how these programs fit into an overall farming system. And so I'm excited about this because I do believe we will be very successful and it will be a model. And as we lead into the global summit, um, I'm very hopeful that we will have this to point to to others when they look at how do we manage our landscape to sequester carbon. This is a unique opportunity and I just wanna thank Monica and Randall and everyone who has worked on helping to bring this to fruition. We have a great partner with Dr. Humiston at UCANR. And so 
we're very committed to making sure that this is successful and that it works for every farmer. We have as much diversity in farming as we do in the population of California, their practices, where they're farming, um, but the first language that they use. So I really believe that this is a tremendous and unique opportunity, and I want to thank everyone for the work that's been put into this. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, let me entertain a motion before we do more council. Mo moved and seconded. Um, <clears throat> we have uh, three commenters on this, and then we'll bring it back to the council. Um, Sarah Schremer, Jeannie Merrill, and Paul Towers. Why don't we do it in that order? Morning. Um, my name is Sarah Schramer with the California Association of Resource Conservation Districts. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, we support this item to provide $5 million to support technical assistance, and we are greatly encouraged by the background materials focused on providing robust technical assistance um, for the Climate Smart Ag programs. Our CDs have been and continue to provide technical assistance for these programs as we work with California's farmers and ranchers on implementing climate smart ag uh, practices um, and how to access grant funds uh, throughout the state. We also support legislation making its way through the capital that would create technical assistance funding, uh, excuse me, from appropriations to CDFA for healthy soils, SWEEP and AMP. We view the TA funding that could be derived from this bill as additive to the funding you, the council are discussing today, rather than supplantive and um, going forward should the legislation pass. Thank you. Thank you. Jeannie. Hi. Great to be here. I also want to just say a quick thanks to Randall for all the excellent work. It's been really a wonderful partnership and really appreciate where we are today um, due to his leadership and the wonderful work of the council. So thank you. Um, so we're very excited about uh, the two proposals before us today. Um, we've seen a real need from um, the farmers that we work with, because I'm with the California Climate and Agriculture Network, as a reminder. Um, we work with uh, farmers up and down the state of all uh, uh, sizes who are very concerned with and interested in um, how to incorporate um, concerns around climate change into their work because there are other agronomic and economic benefits to that as well. Farmers are on the front lines to a changing climate. We're experiencing that right now. Um, so the two proposals I think are really key. Continuing on SGC's work to provide technical assistance on uh, grant application assistance is very important. The message that we hear loud and clear is the more one-on-one -on -one assistance that we can do, the better. Um, so sort of shifting away from solely a workshop-based uh, focus, which I think is where we're headed. Um, and then on the UC ANR uh, Climate Smart Ag team proposal, it's just a deepening of that technical assistance that we really need. It's um, ongoing year-round um, support to do transformative agricultural practices, which will keep our farmers on the land and keep our food security um, secure. Um, and we would agree, I would agree with the previous comments that we think the legislative uh, proposals, um, both uh, AB 2377 to incorporate technical assistance into the Climate Smart Ag programs um, is complementary to this effort, as well as um, SB 1072, which would um, sort of institutionalize technical assistance at SGC. Um, all those efforts, I think, are really additive. Um, and Trust for Public Land couldn't be here today, and they asked me also to just to speak in support. Um, they've been working very hard on SB uh, 1072 with a number of partners and are excited to see today's proposal as well. Thanks. Thank you. Paul? Thanks, Mr. Chair and members, um, and thanks again to Randall for all your hard work and Monica for this proposal. Um, yeah, just on behalf of the California Farmer Justice Collaborative and Pesticide Action Network, uh, we are a collaborative of uh, several dozen mostly farm service organizations and farmers of color that work uh, across the state uh, to uh, utilize the Climate Smart Act programs as well as a myriad of other state and federal programs uh, towards uh, ecological farming practices. Um, I, I think just to say we, we very much also support this proposal and both, uh, both components of it. Um, we really believe in the most effective and focused technical assistance to serve those that need it most in the places that they need it most. 
Um, and so I think continuing along that path, we're excited to hear more of the details in today's proposal. We put a, a uh, submitted a letter earlier this week underscoring our interests and, and actually heard some of those reflected today, so excited to hear that. In particular, we see technical assistance at 25% as sort of the minimum for socially disadvantaged farmers and continue to think that um, with the passage of the Farmer Equity Act last year, the signal that we need to look at uh, supporting those farmers that need it most. Uh, our most under-resourced farmers um, need that extra hand uh, in the process, and that's why we see technical assistance as a the sort of critical uh, component in equity. Um, and particularly, we see workshops as an opening a door to the, to that space. Um, but as uh, Jeannie shared, we see an, you know a hand through that process. This one-on-one -on -one is is fundamentally critical, and continue to underscore the need for that. Um, and then, yes, we also agree that um, this is, we see this as complementary to the efforts around um, some of the legislation in the legislature, AB 2377. So again, just really appreciate uh, this conversation and this support from the council and continue to um, support efforts that focus on uh, underserved farmers uh, that need uh, technical assistance most in the ways they need it most. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, comments from the council, Mike. Yeah, uh, comment and a question, a very supportive, I don't know anything about farming, so uh, I have tomatoes in my backyard and I need technical assistance in that area, but that's, a, that's an entirely different topic for discussion. Um, on, the, on the urban side, the technical assistance program is just absolutely critical. It's, it goes so far beyond just uh, providing technical assistance on an application. You're, you're actually building better projects, you're creating uh, and, and fostering relationships that wouldn't have existed uh, prior to uh, you stepping in. So I think it's absolutely critical. Uh, very excited about the increased funding levels and um, I'm seeing the fruit on a daily basis. I'm in Southern California in an urban area uh, and seeing the, the fruits of your labor on a regular basis. So congratulations on that. A question on the, I believe in the budget there's a million dollars for the Beacon program and the for the Institute for Local Governance, and how does that relate to this, or does it relate to this, and what's the path forward for that? So I can I can answer that, and thank you, Councilmember Flad, for for bringing it up. I know we had a chance to discuss briefly beforehand. So there's this is referring to the two million dollars that appeared in the in, in the budget um, that staff was frankly just made aware of early this week, and that you know will, as uh, Natalie mentioned, likely go for a vote tomorrow, and um, it's looking like it, it, it will pass. Um, the short answer is that we are going to staff, go back with this proposal, definitely speak with both legislative staff, the governor's office, and ILG themselves and the Beacon program that's, that's mentioned in the legislation to um, uh, make sure that the efforts dovetail. Uh, we work with the Institute uh, for the government pretty extensively as it is, um, insofar as having conducted workshop workshops with them and would want to make sure that that work continues to be uh, dovetailed. Um, so it's something that I think we can get back to you on once we, you know, the budget is finalized, once we're able to, I think, speak with, uh, for instance, ILG and, and, and staff with a kind of refined game plan. If, if I can just off on that so the the and and I would love to have a report back on how that relationship will will be coordinated because I think coordination is critical the the beacon program again also serving disadvantaged communities also uh, with the sole purpose of reducing greenhouse gas emissions and so they should be coordinated um, South just a little plug for Southgate Southgate was the first disadvantaged community to receive recognition from ILG in the beacon program um, and it's expanded dramatically since 2015 I think was the the year that Southgate received recognition um, um, what I, so your comment about we don't live single issue lives is so critical at the city level because we're, you know, we're out there fighting crime and filling potholes and picking up trash and to get the environment on the radar screen, we really have to raise awareness. And I think the the Beacon program does that. It's sort of your translator or your your awareness raiser for the environment as an issue that needs to be a part of, of everything we're dealing with at the local level. So mm -hmm. thanks. And I'll just one other point to add to that. That's, this is near term and for our. Uh, new executive director, Luis. Um, uh, uh, we have been, SGC has been invited to a round table that ILG is hosting on uh, July 19th on this very topic. Um, and so we will certainly be taken, taking part um, and I'll be sure to touch base with, uh, with Luis before I, before I part ways so that we can, we can get synced up. So thank you. Other comments? I have a, a quick one or two. Um, first, I, I want to underscore Mike's point that uh, the existing TA has been 
hugely beneficial, and, and you showed it in your slide, but really uh, impressive. Second, um, I had an interesting talk with a rancher a couple of years ago in which he said, farmers are really good at overproducing when you have incentives done in, in certain ways. And uh, his point was that farmers can become carbon farmers and that they will overproduce and sequester carbon. And so I think the idea of smart, climate smart ag is to get out the information that allows farmers to use the techniques that are part of uh, sequestration in soil that also increase yields and, and uh, have better uh, outcomes for, for water. So uh, in addition, we, uh, as Karen mentioned, we hope to connect this effort up in California with some extensive work being done in France and in places like Carretero uh, State in Mexico uh, around similar techniques and using uh, the Under Two Coalition and the jurisdictions in that um, to spread these uh, far and wide because uh, of the potential uh, for soil sequestration and benefits for, uh, for agriculture more broadly. So this is a small piece, but it's part of a larger effort. So with that, uh, I guess we can call the question. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, it passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, Moving right along to uh, item eight, affordable housing and sustainable communities program, the recommended awards for fiscal year 2016. And let me yeah, I'm, turn it over to Bob. <coughs> well, I'm, I'm afraid I have to recuse myself from this agenda item, so excuse me, thank you. Bob is out. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. All right. I hope it wasn't something I said. <laughs> it may have been, but. <laughs> Uh, Good morning, Council. Good morning. I'm Craig Shields with the Department of Housing and Community Development and a very proud member of the Affordable Housing and Sustainable Communities team. We are here this morning to ask the Council to approve stack, staff recommendations for $497 million in cap and trade funding for the fiscal year 2016-17 Affordable Housing and Sustainable Communities program to 19 projects supporting greenhouse gas emissions reductions and related co-benefits. The AHCC program vision is to fund projects that result in the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions and vehicle miles traveled and increased accessibility of housing, employment centers and key destinations through infill development and low carbon transportation options such as walking, biking, and transit. We frame our projects into three eligible project types, transit oriented development, integrated connectivity projects, and our rural innovation project areas. Uh, in this funding round, we made a number of uh, streamlining improvements, including uh, omitting the somewhat unpopular concept application. Uh, in our application process, once the applications cleared the threshold review, they were reviewed for three scoring components, the GHG quantification methodology review performed by the Air Resources Board, the quantitative policy scoring reviewed by HCD, and the interagency narrative review uh, performed by a small but mighty interagency team who reviewed all of the applications um, as one team to ensure consistency across the reviews. Uh, HCD also evaluated the financial feasibility for each project, and we received a handful of uh, support letters from MPOs. Um, each of those just gave a sort of a blanket uh, recommendation for all of the uh, projects submitted within their uh, organization. We received a total of 54 proposals. Uh, five of those were either incomplete or withdrawn because they received uh, TCC awards. We reviewed 49 applications uh, that totaled 
million dollars of requested funding, and we are here today to recommend 19 of those projects for award. This chart represents the distribution of funding across the eligible project types. We uh, first made sure that our targets for each of the three project types were met, and then we selected the next highest ranking projects, which resulted in 39% of the funding being for TOD, 42% uh, for ICP, and 19% for our rural innovation project areas. Mr. Chair? just people watching and otherwise, they might not have an acronym dictionary in front of them uh, just to help them. Yeah, the TOD is the Transit Oriented Development, uh, ICP Integrated Connectivity Project, and RIPA, of course, is the Rural Innovation Project Area. Thank you. Before Ryan uh, talks about some of the great projects uh, that we're recommending for award, I wanna go through a few of the sort of resulting statistics one of our statutory requirements is to invest 50% of the funds in disadvantaged communities. We're very pleased that uh, in this round, 71% of the funds will be invested directly in disadvantaged communities. Also, this round uh, introduced tracking of the low-income communities, part of AB 1550, and 90% uh, of the funds will be invested in those uh, low-income communities. Also, 3% of the funds will be invested in the half-mile sort of buffer zone around disadvantaged communities. And while the round three guidelines encourage more robust transportation infrastructure, we still saw um, a good number going to um, affordable housing. 71% of the total funds will go towards affordable housing and related infrastructure. Uh, resulting in almost 2,000 new affordable housing units. I think that's a number we can really be proud of. <coughs> and in our transportation and transit improvements, more than 20% of the total funding, about $71.6 million, is being allocated for transportation-related investments. $60 million for transportation uh, infrastructure. That's important elements like the bike lane, the bus, and then almost 11 million in transportation related amenities. Those are elements that make walking, biking, and transit safer, more comfortable, and sometimes kind of fun, like the, the bus shelter, safe bike racks, uh, street trees, things like that. This map shows the uh, graphic distribution of our awards. We're uh, recommending four awards in Bay Area communities, seven uh, in Southern California, three, I'm sorry, two in the San Diego area, four in the San Joaquin Valley, two in North State Sierra. And now my colleague Ryan is going to talk about a few of the great projects we're recommending. Thanks. Thank you, Craig. Uh, hello, council members. My name is Ryan Silber. I'm with the Strategic Growth Council. I work on the Affordable Housing Sustainable Communities Program. So. One of our recommended projects here, I'm just gonna walk through a few examples quickly. We have the Florence Neighborhood Mobility Project in the County of Los Angeles. It's within a top 5% disadvantaged community, according to Cal Enviro Screen. Uh, it is 100% affordable with 54 units set aside for those at risk of homelessness. Uh, it also contains active transportation infrastructure uh, with climate adaptive uh, components to it as well. We have uh, this Keeler Court project, which is uh, one of the first of two projects this round awarded in the city of San Diego proper. Uh, it includes 70 affordable units at deep affordability across a number of size of bedrooms, making it accessible to families, uh, and also includes uh, a couple active and bus transportation components as well. Here we have our first project awarded to the city of San Bernardino. Uh, it's 147 affordable units uh, across a range of sizes. It also includes some at-market uh, units as well for an integrated complex and uh, includes a walkway to a local elementary school that didn't previously exist. And we have a uh, rural innovation project here in the city of Lamont. 
which was also an awardee of an active transportation program uh, over four miles of sidewalk improvements. Uh, it's in a largely farm worker, uh, a farm worker uh, populated area. So it's uh, another great project we he have here recommended today. So uh, the technical assistance efforts, I won't spend too long on here since we just had a great presentation by our colleague, Monica Palmira. But we, uh, as staff for the program, had six workshops uh, for applications and getting uh, applicants prepared for the program uh, across the state. Uh, and that included roundtable sort of sit downs with uh, electeds, uh, cities, NPOs, uh, developers, trying to identify either potential projects for future rounds or really prepare them for the application period and seeing what's still needed to be. Uh, readied uh, ahead of the October uh, release of funding. So uh, during the actual application period, program staff uh, readily fielded questions. Uh, if they were applicable to the greater field of applicants, we posted a frequently asked questions uh, document online. So we really tried to stay responsive to, uh, to questions posed by our, by our applicants. Uh, the actual technical assistance program, as Monica mentioned, 12 of the 19 awarded projects today received technical assistance. Um, and we, we are aware of there are not any projects uh, in the, the city of Sacramento being awarded, and there are only two of eight projects submitted by the city of Los Angeles being awarded. So we, we are committed to providing uh, technical assistance to these areas to get a, uh, you know, better applications and trying to help them in the, in the next round of funding. So we are constantly evolving as a program, staying uh, aware of the, the issues that program inherently can provide to uh, our applicants and just the difficult nature of it uh, being an integrated program across transportation and housing and a number of other fields. Uh, so we are evolving. Uh, we, for instance, uh, those of the math gurus out there may have noticed between the housing and transportation, there's 1% of funding missing from a program. That is the program's cost component, which we allow up to $500,000 for program costs, but that was largely dominated by our required transit pass components this round. So we're looking at how to uh, make more funding available for other programs that would fit well within our, our projects. Uh, we have a couple of other different uh, issues we've got on our radar. Uh, I can uh, field any questions about these in particular or any other topics you may have, uh, but just for the sake of time, we'll keep moving. So as our director, Randall, mentioned, we are moving towards an annual schedule for the program, uh, and that's in line with quarterly auctions locked in place uh, and continuous appropriations for the program and trying to create more certainty for future applicants. And also for unsuccessful applicants, if they were not awarded this round, they can reapply and potentially be awarded in a single or one more calendar year. Uh, and to match up with that sort of recurring uh, funding theme, we're trying to maintain some consistency with our guidelines so that we're not requiring too much uh, change by unsuccessful applicants if they wish to reapply. Uh, as I mentioned, we're still evolving and we've got issues that we want to address, but we, we're going to keep the, the bones of the program in place. So we are looking to release draft funding guidelines for the next round in late summer with a uh, release of funding availability and the actual application in uh, late fall, uh, October, hopefully, of this year with the uh, application due date in February and awards being made one year from today, maybe, depending on when the council schedules its, its meeting. So we, uh, our next immediate steps, we have calls uh, and meetings scheduled with unsuccessful applicants in the, the coming weeks. And we have a lessons learned tour in four locations across the state where we'll be hearing feedback from applicants from this round and also uh, you know, fielding questions about what would make their applications more success or more successful in the future if they intend to reapply, which we definitely encourage. Uh, we are continuing to do outreach and capacity building with uh, uh, jurisdictions that voice uh, 
we've also uh, want to continue uh, applications in, in the future or uh, submit a new application for areas. Uh, we want to see applications from all across the state. And so I just want to recommend funding on behalf of program staff for over $250 million to affordable housing and transportation infrastructure that will go towards creating safer, uh, healthier, more economically secure and opportunity access, uh, more opportunity access opportunities to California communities through 19 projects with the HSC program. And happy to field any questions for you all. So I, I have a question um, anticipating one of the issues here. Um, there were three uh, proposals, three projects under the uh, transportation category that had the same score. And unfortunately, they were right at the cutoff for, for um, awards. And I wonder if you can walk us through how uh, you decided one was to get the award, but the other two were not. Uh, yeah, so um, just to provide a preamble, uh, we received uh, you know, fewer applications this year, but they were more competitive than we've seen in the past just due to uh, the program being around for three rounds now. So it was a, a highly competitive field, but uh, as you stated, there were four applications with the same score, and we did award funding with our discretionary funding to the top scoring applications. So we're only able to award two of those four applications. So our tie-breaking scenario, which we laid out in our guidelines as a, a scoring process, was a rebinning of greenhouse gas scoring. And that, that phrase, rebinning, probably sounds pretty foreign to you all now. But our greenhouse gas components uh, are from each project are essentially compared to each other and graded on a curve. So with those projects that did not get awarded based on our project area type designations or the non-discretionary funding, we scored them again, uh, regardless of project type, all against each other, uh, which, as I mentioned, is laid out in our guidelines. And according to that rebinning, uh, the new scores that were, they were provided were used to reorder those projects, even though they, uh, and it's, ju it's just these four projects in question. Uh, reorder those four projects according to their rebind score. And we, uh, we felt this was fair, seeing as it is laid out in our guidelines, and this is at its root a greenhouse gas reducing program. Thank you. Any questions? Matt? Uh, you identified um, in the report key policy issues for consideration in future rounds, and I've uh, interested in the home ownership projects. Mm -hmm. We say that uh, uh, none have been awarded for home ownership developments. Uh, am I interpreting that correctly, meaning that n we're not awarding any money for projects where uh, the uh, developments we put up for sale for home ownership in, in the future? Is that, am I reading that correctly? Yeah, in this round, we have no home ownership projects awarded, so none of the projects are available for or none of the units in the projects are available for purchase. Mm -hmm. uh, and home ownership projects are an eligible um, project type for us. Uh, well, I guess project type is probably the wrong term, seeing as that confuses with our, our acronyms there. But home ownership projects are eligible. And we have awarded them in the past. But inherently, uh, home ownership projects in affordable housing generally come in at a higher level of affordability uh, than what we usually see with these rental projects and what our program guidelines are uh, stating is acceptable. So we're, we're trying to analyze if maybe there's some way, some guidance we can provide to home ownership projects to work within our guidelines or whether we need to create a possible exception to get more home ownership projects because we absolutely recognize that home ownership is a a great vehicle for economic uh, mobility upwards through through class systems, and it's something we really want to uh, to promote in the future. Well, that 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 helps explain. There was a sentence here that confused me. It said um, the guidelines will facilitate competitive home ownership applications as these provide generational equity that aid in economic mobility. I was mm -hmm. I was hoping that that could be interpreted for me. Um, yeah, yeah. So um, I guess that's getting a bit more into. Uh, to economics, but uh, uh, just that home ownership is uh, basically, uh, it's a provider of generational wealth base for families that uh, it's 
so like a bank account essentially that okay. uh, as you move through generations it can be passed along and it's really a provision for um, you know, upward mobility. Uh, okay. So it, it provides a, if the home ownership provides the ability to invest in a piece of property, build up equity in that property, which can then in turn be used to move up socially or use for uh, other purchases. Yeah, pass it on to the next generation. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. So it's, it's something we'd, we, we hope to provide in, uh, in the future rounds and see some applications and hopefully some awards. Um, I had a, a, just one further question. It was on, um, and you know, if it, it, there's always a problem if if you give us a very very thick report, then we'll say, well, how can you possibly expect us to read a report this long? <laughs> this, uh, you, you know, you need to sort through this and, and give us more detailed information, concise information. And then when you get something that's smaller, then we say, well, we need more information. This is impossible. I can't make a decision on this. I, I, I it would help. Uh, you know, I like. Pictures are worth a thousand words. I'm looking at. I'm about to uh, authorize, you know, almost 300 million dollars, whatever, for projects which are described to me in seven pages. Um, it, it would help to have a little bit more visual or something that in future that just uh, to, to to note that so I could have a better feel for what these projects are like. I think, um, uh, and and in particular, I was looking at one. It was a San Pablo project, mm -hmm. uh, or, or on San Pablo Street, and it says, construct 51 unit uh, affordable housing development for low income seniors, and then it says uh, transportation improvements will be made throughout the project area, including two miles of bike lanes, two bike share stations, and improvements between the housing development and Hoover Elementary School, and I, I was w trying to come up with a connection between housing for seniors and a improvements between the housing development and the Hoover Elementary School. I, I, how do, do we look at whether these projects make a, a, a coherent whole? Is there, uh, do they all relate to one another? Or do we have, is this a project where, well, it provides some housing and then they just sort of thrown in some other things, which are beneficial, mm -hmm. but I, do they really make sense at the end of the day? Sure. Do you really need a, a pathway from the senior housing to the elementary school? Mm -hmm. Well, our projects are focused on community connectivity, so our transportation components need to be accessible to the public. Uh, with, uh, I can't speak to this project specifically, and I haven't, I don't have a, a map in my in my okay. mind here, but uh, we do grade projects uh, due to, um, you know, are you locating housing near resources, uh, and resources are things like grocery stores, medical clinics, things that people need in their everyday lives to, uh, you know, to really get by. And, and the, uh, the sidewalk connecting the elementary school to the senior housing developments, uh, while that direct linkage right there may seem strange, it's likely also connecting uh, other resources as well along the way because our, our project types are kind of, they're defined, we have a one mile radius around the housing development and a half mile radius around the transportation infrastructure improvements. So it's, that's how we qualify resources. And basically, if you're providing uh, an improvement in this project area, the resources need to be located nearby. So in that sense, yes, there is a consideration of the connectivity of the overall project. Mm -hmm. um, does that answer your question there? or? Something we could, uh, as I said, I, I think in, in future it'd be helpful for members of the council to have a little bit more information so we can, when you have a question, there's something in front of you you can look at to sort of answer some of these questions. And I, I think we do need to consider, it's good to evaluate a project like this. Oh, and, and it seems like a fine project, so I don't want to say that we shouldn't be funding this project, but. The, does this make sense? Um, I understand it would make sense to have senior housing and have walkways from that senior housing to a shopping center or a store or something. This seemed a little bit curious to me, um, and I wanted to make sure that the we're, we sit back and take a look at do these projects always make sense and is our scoring appropriate? And I'll, I'll take that as a, a staff error there on highlighting probably a not so pertinent detail of the project. Uh, 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 staff, staff error in telling the truth. I don't, I don't know that that's, <laughs> that, 
I don't know if staff error, but I, it just it would be helpful that when you identify issues like this to be prepared to discuss them through, and it, it would help to have a little bit and more information. Be happy to follow up with more information on the awarded projects. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, I would entertain uh, a motion on uh, the staff proposal. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Yep. Motion and a second. Um, we have uh, some public comment on this item. So let's uh, start with Carolyn Tarosis, followed by Alicia Sebastian. Good morning, Chair Alex and honorable members of the Strategic Growth Council. It's really a pleasure to be here. My name is Carolyn Tarosis, uh, and I'm here on behalf of the Los Angeles County Chief Executive Officer uh, to speak in strong support of the recommendation before you. Um, in particular, we would like to support the three projects in unincorporated Los Angeles County, the East Los Angeles Wellness Hub and Cavalry Cemetery Walking Path, the Florence Neighborhood Mobility Project, which was shown before you, and the Willowbrook II Project. With this funding, this will enable the construction of over 320 affordable housing units that might not otherwise come to fruition without the Affordable Housing and Sustainable Communities Program. Additionally, these awards will provide for much needed improvements throughout the communities surrounding the housing developments, including a two mile rubberized walking path in a community that is severely lacking green space and recreational activities. Uh, additionally, this funding will provide for a workforce development center at one of our housing developments, as well as a child care center and public park improvements for our Los Angeles County parks. Uh, so to um, Council Member Rodriguez's question, I think that the projects we've put before you really do make sense for the communities in which they're situated. Additionally, this program has provided for a first of its kind collaboration amongst numerous county departments and public agencies, and it's really changed the way that we do business in Los Angeles County. Uh, we've created new working groups, new approaches to transit-oriented planning, uh, and truly a first of its kind collaboration in our county. Uh, and, and we're very grateful to the state and to the Strategic Growth Council Randall and his leadership and the rest of the staff in helping push us towards uh, this really place-based approach to building healthy, safe communities. Uh, so again, we look forward to the continued collaboration with the Strategic Growth Council and HCD, uh, and we thank you, and again, urge uh, your, your yes vote today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Alicia, followed by Troy Hightower. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Alicia Sebastian. I am with the California Coalition for Rural Housing. Uh, CCRH is a TA provider in partnership with HCD and SGC. Um, and we worked in partnership with the um, self-help enterprises as those TA providers. And they were unable to be here today and ask me as a TA provider to step forward and convey their gratitude for the recommendation of award. Um, they are grateful for the opportunity to continue their partnership with the state in serving the disadvantaged rural communities of the San Joaquin Valley. So thank you so much for their consideration today. Thank you. Troy, followed by Andy Madera. Good morning, Chair <clears throat> and members of the council. <clears throat> Excuse me. Forgive me for my throat. I'm, I'm sensitive to air quality. Uh, I'm here representing the Mountain View Project in Lamont, and I just want to make a few statements. Uh, one, there's a number of uh, community members and community organizations that unfortunately couldn't make it here that do support uh, this project. Uh, the other is I'd like to commend uh, Randall and his staff and the TA that Monica and them provided on this project. I think it was uh, essential to how we got here. Uh, and then finally, I think the this project could be a model for future rural projects. And with that, I urge you to approve staff's recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Andy, followed by Alexander Pratt. Uh, good morning, my name is Andy Madera. I'm with Eden Housing. We're an affordable housing provider. 
um, that provides uh, family supportive housing uh, and senior housing throughout the state. Uh, we are the sponsor along with uh, AC Transit, our co-sponsor on um, Alameda Family Project. Um, it's located in the um, city of Alameda on what was a um, Naval Air Base and has really been trying to be reused um, for decades now. Uh, this is really um, the first project for, um, for that base reuse. Um, we applied last year on our, this is part of a 130 project, uh, affordable project. Um, our application today uh, was for the family component. Last year we applied for the senior component. Um, and the, um, uh, under the ICP, uh, the, we were providing really key transportation infrastructure that uh, really was part of a coherent whole for the development of this um, nexus of 600 unit um, market rate site. Um, it provided uh, bike connectivity uh, to the rest of uh, the city of Alameda to tie it to the site. Um, which tied it to a new AC transit um, site uh, bus stop that provided trans-based service to San Francisco. Um, part of our uh, application was for um, an electric bus to provide that transportation to San Francisco and get cars off the road, um, as well as um, tying to uh, a new ferry terminal um, that was being developed as part of this master plan development. Um, so uh, we were one of those uh, projects that were tied. Um, we look forward to understanding um, better the sort of technical issues, I assume, around the GHG calculation. We did use um, Enterprise to make those calculations for us, so um, we appreciate any feedback that we can get from staff as to how um, we can make those technical corrections um, for next time, um, and we appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank, thank you for that. I, I will note that we spent some time talking about this project so the staff will have some very specific comments for you and we encourage you to reapply. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Alexander Pratt and uh, I'm with MCAL Multi Housing. And uh, we just wanted to thank uh, SGC and HCD and the County of Los Angeles and the City of Long Beach for all of their support. We've been in affordable housing business for 40 years. We've done over 63 projects. Um, I want to second all of the thoughts about the technical assistance that was provided. I think it was very critical. We've been building housing for a long time, but when it comes to adding infrastructure and understanding all the dynamics of connectivity, uh, it's bringing things to a whole nother level. And I think it's really been something that we've been looking for in the development of communities for all of these years what things can we layer along with housing? That's why we have social services with housing. That's why we're adding special needs to housing. So making a difference in the transportation is, uh, is a big deal. Also, I wanna second uh, the comments that Carolyn made about the County of Los Angeles. Uh, we came to them with the Florence Project, I think two years ago when this program first began. And when we sat down with the folks from Public Works and said we wanna work and talk about infrastructure and how we can tie our housing to an infrastructure project, we got a bunch of blank looks and everybody looked around and said, we already have funding for our projects and we're not sure what you're talking about. And I was there with someone from the supervisor's office. So it's not like I just came in by myself. Uh, so in the course of one year, uh, they managed to pull together so much technical assistance with support from AGC that all of a sudden we had this process where we worked for six months and looked in great detail and toured and toured and went you know, all over the place. I think in order to put together meaningful projects. So I think this process is working. I might also commend H HCD, who I've also worked with for many years, uh, and as, a, as an agency that moves gradually, obviously, and a lot of things have had to happen over the last couple of years for HCD to be able to be in this process, uh, such as just coming out with their new regulations and adjusting things on the fly. So it's a big challenge. So I commend the folks at HCD because they've had to do a lot in order to absorb all these various projects and all the special needs projects that are coming through the state. So we look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you very much for this opportunity and I think we uh, appreciate the opportunity to serve people in the Southern California and throughout the state. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, Rachel Hatch and Alan Knott, followed by Angie Minetti. My, my name is Rachel Hatch, Program Officer for the McCall Foundation based in Redding, California, joined here also by Shannon Phillips, our Chief Operating Officer, and 
uh, Alan from K2 Land and Investment, who you'll hear from in just a moment. Uh, we brought with us today a team of people who helped to put together uh, the competitive application uh, from Reading, really focused on the goals of greenhouse gas reduction, ve reducing vehicle miles traveled, the housing goals of this program, really designing the project from the ground up with those in mind. So we want to thank uh, staff from HCD, from Strategic Growth Council, and for the council for this consideration. Uh, we wanted to achieve those goals, but this also means so much more to a community that is hustling hard to revitalize our downtown. Uh, I want to give you just a taste of some of the community players uh, who are here today with us. Maybe you can stand. Mayor Kristen Schrader from the City of Reading and the City Director of Public Works, Chuck Auckland, huge partners in this effort. John Truitt, Executive Director of Viva Downtown, which is a national Main Street organization. One of the program officers, uh, uh, program operators who's in our, included in our application, uh, Ann Thomas from Shasta Levine Streets. She's the one wearing the I like bike button everywhere she goes. Uh, and last but not least, Bruce Ross, District uh, Director for Assemblyman Dolly, who's been a supporter of this project. Uh, we're a community that's really in an urban-rural interface. I think of us as rural-ish, obviously not a technical term, but is reflective of the character of the place. Uh, and so one of the things we're looking at going forward from the McCall Foundation's perspective is how we can tie together these types of infill development projects with some of the land management that we do as a funder where we look at things like the Healthy Soils Initiative, the SALT grant, and so on. Uh, so I want to turn it over. Oh, and I'm supposed to say thanks uh, for consideration from Dan Little. He's out of the country. We're all jealous of him, but he would be here today if he could. Uh, and they say that lightning doesn't strike twice in the same place, but we've been lucky for the potential of that in Reading. So I just want to turn it over to our co-applicant, uh, Alan Knott, to say a couple words as well. Thanks. <clears throat> uh, well, good morning. Uh, I'm Alan Knott with K2 Companies. And um, when I look at this project, and I think of all the technical terms and, and you're talking about the acronyms, and I think about our city, I think about happy dance and buzzing. I mean, those are the things that are happening right now in the city of Reading when we think about this project. And I'll say it's intentional because we've, we've, we've uh, been through this application process now twice. But when you look at how the application is written and what it does to a community beyond just developing a project, but that it brings all of these players together and a lot of times in a development, as a developer, you do what's the minimal amount of everyone else's uh, check boxes to get the project through. But what this grant application does, it requires you to maximize each of those components impact on your community. And this project, block seven, is really a continuation of round two. And round, uh, uh, round two was the Market Street project which is uh, the start of the completion of the downtown, reintroduction of the downtown streets in the city of Reading. And the timing of this is, is just optimal for our town and our downtown. So I encourage you, if you're driving up I-5, uh, drive through downtown Reading today over the next six to nine months. And then we'd encourage you to come back in the next two to three years. And some of you had a chance to already uh, walk the sites and see the transformation and the impact just two rounds will make on our downtown. So thank you for considering our project. Thank you. Uh, okay, Angie, followed by Josh Candelaria. Hi, good morning, Council Chairman and members. My name's Angie Minetti here um, on behalf of the City of Fresno in strong support of the motion on the table today and also uh, for the um, award for the Blackstone McKinley Transit Oriented Development. Um, for the City of Fresno, very significantly disadvantaged community with a Cal Enviro score of 97.41%. Um, um, we believe that this project will be a catalyst to kickstart the revitalization within the area. Um, this corridor will connect northern and central Fresno to downtown and to the high speed, the, um, pr the uh, projected high speed rail station. Um, Furthermore, this is going to be the first lead uh, goal designation and net zero building in Fresno, which we believe will set an example in the area and also sort of provide that standard for development in the um, in the Fresno region. So we very much thank you for the award and um, support the motion today. 
Thank you. Uh, Josh, followed by Christina Loki. Good morning, Mr. Uh, Chairman, Council Member Josh Candler on behalf of the County of San Bernardino. I'll be real brief, just wanna urge uh, staff's recommendation and kind of address another issue. We really feel the Arrowhead Grove project is transformational in an area that really needs investment. And it's also making the cultural changes. We recognize, I think there's kind of a paradigm when it comes to the Inland Empire, you kind of think of logistics. And with the designation of TCC, in addition to, I think this project before you, it really shows we're making the cultural changes. We're innovative, doing development, I think it's consistent with the goals of the program. So we just urge uh, staff's recommendation. And just if it's appropriate, I cannot underscore, I think the appreciation our region has for uh, staff. They've done a fantastic job really demonstrating the values of the organization on a statewide level. So thanks for that. Thank you. Christina, followed by Nick Ramo. Hi, Christina Lockie with the Sacramento Area Council of Governments. And I just wanted to thank staff for the comments made regarding the lack of awardees in the immediate Sacramento region. And we look forward to working with you to address this in future rounds. Thank you. Thank you. Nick? Good afternoon, I'm Nick Romo on behalf of Senator Connie Leva. I'm here to urge your support of the staff's recommendation for the Arrowhead, Arrowhead Grove project in San Bernardino County, echoing what San Bernardino County uh, Josh Candelaria said. Um, it truly is transformational. We're trying to um, change ha the vision of San Bernardino County and the Inland Empire as a whole to make it not only a, a logistics place, but a place for communities to live and strive. So with that, I uh, urge your approval. Thank you. Thank you. All right, comments uh, from the council. Okay, I'll make a short, <laughs> a short comment. Um, uh, it's not every day you get to uh, give away $257 million. Um, that is uh, uh, generally uh, a good thing. It's also sometimes uh, creates uh, some who did not get funded. And we, I want to say we very much appreciate the applications that uh, were very good, including the Eden Housing Program, that uh, were very close to being successful and encourage continuing uh, effort on those. Um, they're they're not uh, they're very good projects and we would like to fund them. Uh, we are now over seven hundred million dollars um, in our funding from this program, and with the next round expect to to be uh, north of a billion. So and, and now we have uh, legislative um, approval going forward for the greenhouse gas reduction funds uh, out through 2030. So uh, assuming the continuing appropriation continues, um, this will be an ongoing significant uh, source of funding for affordable housing and sustainable communities. Um, I do wanna note really how the strong support for staff and for the guidelines and for the process. And I want to underscore, um, I, I think, the council's pride in the work that you've done, and we very much appreciate it. So with that, uh, all in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, the grants are approved. Um, <laughs> congratulations. <laughs> So uh, we have a couple of uh, general public comments and we'll start, uh, I will not get the last name right, Esther Pastagioni looks like, followed by Emily Bush, Estner. Postiglioni, but that's okay, close enough. Um, Esther Postiglioni with California Walks. Good morning, Chair and members of the Council. Um, I'm a little bit late to the meeting. I was here to support um, the California Climate Investment, so I just wanted to go on record to say what a great program it is, um, what a support is really needed in a lot of communities, and that we really are getting a lot of information on not just the needs for some of the proposals that are needed, but the capacity that's needed to really get communities to where they need to be. Um, Randall and Monica and all of the staff at SGC are just wonderful, so just wanted to go on record with support for the great program and hope to see a lot more of these opportunities in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Emily. Good 
Good morning. My name is Emily Bush, and I'm a project manager with the East Bay Asian Local Development Corporation. We're an affordable housing developer in Oakland that's been working uh, for the past 40 years to build affordable housing in Oakland. Uh, I'm here today on behalf of the Lake House Connections Project. This was a round two awardee of the ASIC funds. And this is a mixed income project that is composed of 91 units of affordable housing and 270 units of market rate housing. And since the project was awarded, we've had a, a pretty dramatic change in market conditions that's resulted in uh, escalating construction costs. And for, that, for our project, that's meant an $11 million increase in hard costs that have withstood uh, a pretty aggressive value engineering efforts. Uh, we've also experienced a, um, a change in our tax credit pricing modeling since tax reform, so which has cost us uh, millions, and millions of dollars in equity that we were expecting to uh, be infused into the project. So we, this has basically created a financing gap that we um, have a plan to fix. <laughs> We're gonna be going after A1 regional county bond funds as well as Section 8. But we have a delay in our project start, meaning that we're not going to be able to meet the November 2018 construction start date listed in the ASIC guidelines. And um, so, at, and as you all know, we're uh, facing a housing crisis in the state of California. The Bay Area has been hit especially hard, and we have uh, limited local resources to address the affordable housing uh, limitations. And, um, and so we are very grateful for the $18 million in ASIC funds that were awarded to this project to fund the affordable housing and the num numerous transit improvements that are connected to this project. And we want to put this money to work. Um, and so we are asking, and we've been in touch with HCD staff as well as SGC staff for an extension on those milestone dates to enable us to start construction in March 2019. Uh, so we just wanted, we've had these conversations with staff, wanted to come here today just to again express uh, the need and urgency for this extension and really appreciate your consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for bringing it to our attention. Thank you. I uh, have one more uh, public comment uh, from Amir Rashid. Hello, council members. Thank you so much for your time today. Uh, I'm just here on behalf of the Office of Assemblymember Reyes, who represents San Bernardino and the surrounding area. Uh, and we're really excited to hear about the approval of the Arrowhead Grove project. This project clearly fits the goals of the program, and projects like this are dramatically changing the life and well-being of the individuals in the surrounding area. We're already seeing that with our, with around the Arrowhead Grove neighborhood. So we're really grateful for your time, for the staff's recommendation, and for your approval of the project. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other council comments, business? All right. With that, we are adjourned. Thank you very much.